This episode is about the tools you use to get the job done. But really, it's about the design of the tools. The design of tools made to accomplish multiple tasks and the people who struggle with every action on every screen, every page for every user. The tools you use that can make or break your experience. Keep your business running or gut the productivity of your most valuable asset, your people. An interaction that plays out every day on every device that can drastically change the experience of a user and impact the bottom line of your business. Don't believe me? Just wait. But first, a few thoughts on the brain. See if this sounds familiar. You're in your office and a call comes in. You answer and search through your inbox for a document germane to the conversation while three new emails arrive and distract you from the task. Your cell phone buzzes from a text message while a team messaging app bubbles up on your desktop with new messages. You can't find the document in email and move to search on your desktop or a cloud storage application while listening to the caller and focusing hard on ignoring the multiple messages all competing at the same time for your attention. Your brain feels flooded and the ability to take on critical tasks just seems to fade away. Sound familiar? This is Connection. A podcast that brings you stories and expert opinions from the front lines of the workplace, enabling listeners to reimagine the worlds of employee and customer engagement. One of the ways we like to think about the interfaces as we're building them is how can we enable a user to easily accomplish a job? This is Michael Peachy. He's the vice president of user experience at RingCentral. Nobody gets up in the morning and goes to work in the context of what Ring Central does and says, I'd like to have some meetings, I'd like to talk on the phone, I'd like to send some messages to people. You know, they get up in the morning and they go to work thinking, I would like to be successful, I would like to make a difference, I would like to empower the people around me, whatever it is that they're trying to do to, to self-actualize and move their own organization forward. So, you know, the best possible way to help them do that would be to be just invisible, seamless, just we would be there and do things for them. And we'll come back to Michael shortly. And until then, here's another scenario you might find familiar. You walk up to a door and pull a handle only to discover a sign above the handle that says push. And the door won't open clearly until you push, but it feels awkward as clearly the handle is meant to be pulled. Look, I do this regularly, without fail it seems. And as it turns out, I'm not alone. In fact, it's so common and even has a name, the Norman door. The chances are good that you've been influenced by Don Norman's work. His 1988 book, The Design of Everyday Things is a best-selling text and analysis of how we interact with objects and the mistakes that are often made in doing so. He once said, good design is actually a lot harder to notice than poor design in part because good design fits our needs so well that the design is invisible, serving us without drawing attention to itself. This statement is not one of feeling or intuition. The book it comes from is a serious academic exploration of the nature of how we interact with objects. It is a scientific work from a leading thinker. Don Norman is, after all, a researcher with advanced degrees in multiple fields from universities like MIT, Harvard, and the University of Pennsylvania. In fact, his thesis was titled Sensory Thresholds and Response Biases in Detection Experiments, a Theoretical and Experimental Analysis. So you know that when he approaches the design of objects, he's not seeing these objects through the lens of an artist, but as a scientist would. And his work helps us understand, above all else, what actually makes a good design. I asked Michael how he defined the role of a designer today. And you're getting it, it, one of the things that I'm most passionate about in design, which is demystifying the design process. You know, I think it's easy for people to look at design from the outside and they see a bunch of people sitting around talking about where the buttons go and, you know, what, what color we should use for something. And that is part of the process. There's a certain amount of craft in how you lay something out that people go to school and, and learn. But the majority of what design is, is coming up with hypotheses, ideas. You take in the information that you have and you try to assemble it together into something that makes sense. You know, your idea, my theory is, 
blah, blah, blah. You work to make that hypothesis testable. It's not enough to have an idea. You need to be able to figure out how you're going to go discover whether that idea is true or not. We might call this section how to think like a designer, but I'm tempted to call it how to think. The design process is not a gut intuition on what simply looks good. Designers follow four clearly defined rules in order to make the most of our interactions. The first we'll call finding the voice. On the team, we have, we have lots of stories that we tell ourselves to remind ourselves of our values. One of those stories is the story of Cassandra's voice. Cassandra, for those listeners who don't know, was a mortal back in the, the days of Greek mythology who was beloved by Zeus, the, the king of all the gods, and he gave Cassandra a gift. You know, she was able to, to know the future, to foretell the future. Zeus's wife was a little upset about this and cursed Cassandra with, and nobody will ever pay attention to you. So poor Cassandra wandered the earth knowing all of the tragedies that would befall the various kingdoms and was unable to prevent those tragedies. We look at Cassandra's voice a little differently than the mythology does. The mythology tells this story as a warning to the kings about not paying attention. We use it as a warning to make sure that we're being heard. So a lot of what we do in UX is help a product team or an engineering team or even a customer express what they want to give that voice to Cassandra. Somebody may have a partially formulated idea that needs testing, that needs understanding. We'll work with them to bring that idea out and help them be able to communicate it. And when you get to the kernel of an idea, the real essence that's there, something that originally took 30 minutes of hand-waving and whiteboarding to explain can now be communicated in 30 seconds in a very clear and compelling and actionable way. And for us, that's giving voice to Cassandra. The other piece that's in our values around that is this idea of giving love to ideas that you don't like. It's very much about keeping an open mind when a new idea is raised, even if it's something that somehow seems non-intuitive to you or, or not with your own gut instinct. And what we'll do in those situations is embrace that idea as if it was our own darling and do everything we can to prove that that idea is right. In that process, we will discover that maybe it was fatally flawed as we originally thought. We may discover that it was a brilliant idea, in which case we've, uh, we've moved something forward. Rule number two, articulate the problem. We are trained in the Western world all through school to do problem solving. You know, you sit there in class and somebody asks you a question. What's the capital of Montana? What's the square root of nine? And there's an answer and you're rewarded for knowing the answer. You're not rewarded for talking about how you might discover the answer to something. You're not rewarded for wondering, why do we want to know the square root of nine? So as a result, people are very, very good at finding answers, and they're not particularly good at articulating problems. So a lot of times when somebody brings a new idea to the UX team, they will frame that idea in the context of a solution. The third rule involves the role of ego in the process. He calls this killing your darlings. The best designers are, are very low ego. The problem with a bad idea is not that it's a bad idea. The problem with a bad idea is that it's in the way of a good idea. So the, the process of killing your darlings is to try to get rid of bad ideas as quickly as possible so they can be replaced by something else to look at. That might be good. It might be bad. It might be neither. But the longer that you spend caring for your darlings, the longer it takes you to pick up something new and the bigger the risk is, you know, best case you waste some time, worst case you waste a lot of time going and building something that isn't going to work. So designers, I think in the design mindset, the, the core aspect of that is questioning what you think you know so that you can move the bad ideas out of the way to kill your darlings and move on to something else that's, that's going to, uh, be excellent. And finally, rule number four, develop a testable hypothesis. You need to be able to figure out how you're going to go discover whether that idea is true or not. You go, you run that test. That test may be informal, like talking to three people you trust 
It may be very formal, like building a prototype and going on usertesting.com or running some focus groups and bringing back feedback over the period of months. From there, you pivot your hypothesis, you decide that you're right, you decide that you're wrong, you decide to try again. In that sense, design is very much science. Uh, it goes back to the early days of the scientific method, which were all about developing a hypothesis. What is my theory? How do I test my theory? How do I decide if I'm right? And then communicating that out to other people. That part is a big piece of UX, but it's not specifically design. You know, if you think about that piece, anybody in an organization can develop a hypothesis, go figure out how to test it and report on the results. So that's a lot of what we're doing here at Ring Central is democratizing that user testing process with tools and training for product managers, for engineers, for anybody to be able to go out and help make a convincing argument for what they want to do. Let's pause for a moment and consider the conversation so far. We have discussed how design is more science than art, that there absolutely is a craft involved, but the four steps Michael discussed earlier aim at solving a problem in a testable way that allows for significant benefits for end users. There is a word that Michael used in previous conversations on the topic, one that helps us identify the place in which the craft and the application of a design merge. The word is elegance. One of the examples that I'll use commonly when talking about elegance is the first version of Apple's iPod. There was a click wheel on it. And when this device came out, you would see people just sitting there, spinning the click wheel, feeling the haptic response, watching things scroll by on the screen. Um, there was an elegance, there was a joy to that, to that interaction. A really nice UI will have elements in there that, that do stimulate a little bit of joy in the use. The other piece of elegance that we talk about in UX is what I call the duh factor. When a problem comes in and you work on it for a while and it's hard, it's, it's intractable, you just can't figure out what you're going to do and how you're going to do it and you just keep trying and rejecting ideas and trying and rejecting ideas and talking about it with people and talking about it with users. And then when a design has got elegance, you get to this place where it's easy to explain the document that used to be 50 pages long is now five pages long. And you go and you show it to somebody and they look at what your idea is. They look at your execution of the idea. They look at you with an expression of, well, duh, like how else would you do that? That's the only answer that makes sense, which is usually followed up with a little, and why did that take you six weeks? That ironically is the, the best response that you can get out of something when it's got that elegance where the answer is just obvious. You know, how else would you solve that problem? And to me, that's, that's elegance. I asked Michael to go a little deeper still on the topic of elegance as it applies to his current experience about how this impacts those using the product. We've been doing a lot of work around meetings lately and talk to a group of people what kind of online meetings do you have? What sort of tasks do you engage in? What are your jobs to be done in those meetings? Who else is participating? Who is doing which jobs in the meeting, et cetera? When we've got stuff like that, that's a more general presentation with videos and a broader audience, not with any particular goal in mind, other than helping all of us at Ring Central connect in an emotional and binding way to our, to our customers, to our end users. Nobody gets up in the morning and wants to go use some communication and collaboration products. I mean, I do. Some of the people I know do because we enjoy it. But most people in the world just want to go ahead and do their job. If we do our jobs well at Ring Central, if we can envision and design and build and deliver products that help people do the things they need to do in their professional life, two good things happen. One is these people get more done with less work. Uh, that makes them more successful. That helps them advance in their own careers. It helps them serve their own communities, their users, their coworkers, their customers, their partners. The other thing that getting more done with less work gives you is an opportunity to go home and play with your kids or play with your dog or do some community work or whatever it is that, that brings you joy. 
if we do our jobs well, we are in fact improving the lives at work and not at work of the people we serve. And I think that is the guiding principle that anybody in UX could could give you on why we do what we do. The short of this is that Ring Central is uniquely positioned to deliver this kind of experience to our customers, to their employees, to their own customers, their partners, suppliers, vendors, et cetera. The convergence of the different ways that people communicate and collaborate within an organization, the way you move between a voice call, a video call, a screen share, a message that you send to somebody for them to pick up in the future, meeting transcriptions, notes at the end of the meetings, task assignments, there is a really exciting convergence of all of these things right now. And if we circle back to our mission, how do we help our users get more done with less so they can be more successful and go home and play with their dog? The pieces are out there on the playing board and it's a really exciting time to play. The tools you use can make your experience or break it. Keep your business running or gut the productivity of your most valuable asset, your people. Designers like those on Michael's team rely on the science of user experience and defeat their own egos along the way to ensure the experience of those very valuable assets the very best experience possible. They are to, as Michael put it, ensure people get more done with less work. That people can be more successful, advance in their own career, serve their own communities, their users, their coworkers, their customers, their partners, and more. I'm Robert Murphy. Thank you for listening. Connection is an original podcast from Ring Central and is available through iTunes or the podcast channel of your choice. 